Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, we're gonna bounce around our neighborhood and some other areas around the city of Raleigh and show off some interesting plants here in February. And we'll just jump right into it with rosemary. This is the time of year here in the uh, Raleigh area, Zone 8A, when we see the rosemary really putting on a big show. And so you think of rosemary as just a culinary herb, but it's also a uh, wonderful flowering plant. And they have these great, lavender flowers on them and these are salvias and so salvia has a very interesting you know very interesting flower that's pretty recognizable uh, on most salvias but this mo where most of our annual and perennial salvias bloom spring through fall this one tends to bloom coming right out of the end of winter and then new growth will start on it and of course we can again use this as a culinary herb one great thing about this plant family lamiaceae and we did a video on lamiaceae uh, this plant family um, it's a lot of salvias that we use but it's also all of our a lot of our other culinary herbs it's interesting these plants just kind of um, they kind of created these chemicals uh, to prevent uh, things from eating them but we have used them we use them as culinary herbs but uh, these these chemicals that they're producing to create these scents within the foliage uh, prevent rabbits and deer and other things from eating them. So I kind of, we kind of, in our garden where we have a lot of rabbit problems, we kind of lean into this plant family a little bit because, you know, um, the, the, cause the rabbits aren't destroying them, but really love it. These things need a lot of sun. There's a lot of them in the neighborhood because this neighborhood has a lot of trees in it. A lot of them aren't in quite enough sun and they tend to be a little bit sparse, but this one's out here by the road. It's just absolutely fantastic. And what a show it puts on right here. You know, we're, you know, I, I don't know, February. Oh, it's Valentine's Day, actually. So happy Valentine's Day. Uh, as we're shooting this, it's the uh, 14th of February. This is one of our natives to the southeast. This is in a, a, a small park uh, down below the Raleigh Rose Garden. Uh, this is Ilex glabra or inkberry holly. And we see these, when we see these in the wild, they actually colonize uh, and, can perform, and become big, giant thickets, basically, you know, acres and acres. Uh, with a few palms growing in them here and there, but uh, when we see them down in Florida. But a lot of the, the named varieties, this one's likely shamrock, uh, ten, you know, are individual shrubs. We can, see, still, we can still see this as individual shrubs. It's not forming the kind of thickets uh, that we see out in, the, uh, out in the wild. They will limb themselves up in time. Pretty normal behavior for inkberry hollies. You can do a little top pruning on them, but really it's one of those plants. Um, through plant breeding, we're seeing better ones that keep their foliage a little lower in the plant, but I really think about inkberry hollies being used just like these are, where they're just a, kind of the thing that goes in the back rather than the thing that goes in the front. We tend to put bigger, thing, bigger things in the back and then want to keep the inkberry small. I think we should reverse this and put the inkberries toward the back, understand they're going to limb themselves up a little bit in time, and then plant other things uh, in front of them, like that dwarf, that Ralston's hardy, uh, Viburnum obovatum, the little dwarf one, would look great in front of these. Something like that that would give you the small thing in front and allow these to grow like they grow. And they're really beautiful. They move around in the wind. A great, really rich, dark green color if, they have, if they're in acid soils that most of us have here in the southeast. They do, they do, they do get a little blackberry on them, which is, you know, ink, inkberry holly. That's, what they're, you know, that's, what they're, that's why they're called that. Uh, and just beautiful, just beautiful plants. Um, I think they're probably underused. We typically go out and get boxwoods or other compact evergreen plants to, do, you know, to serve a purpose that we have a great native for. A couple other quick points, very drought tolerant, very shade tolerant, uh, and very salt tolerant. So if you have a lot of those kind of, uh, you know, difficult conditions, uh, that this is another reason to go out and seek out inkberry hollies. A quick cut through the Raleigh Rose Garden and you can see the professionals over here that maintain the Raleigh Rose Garden have cut them all back. Uh, that is a big project. There are a lot of roses out here and uh, but you got to wear some thick gloves for that job. And as Steph comes around with the camera, we showed in another neighborhood tour video this drainage space. This Raleigh Rose Garden sits really, really low and it always is always had drainage problems. Uh, anytime we have an extended period of rain or heavy, heavy rains, this is literally a bowl here. There was a horse track that ran a circle around this at one point, which is super interesting uh, history. There's a curved road at the end of it, and a lot of people may not know that curved road was actually where they raised horses. But this is a bowl down here in the bottom, 
has been a great city park, but again, it has has water issues. So they came in here and did this big project a few years back and put uh, some native and non-native uh, plants in here, mostly native plants, but they've cut the white mully grass back. We showed the white mully grass in a previous video. It was up beautiful, but it's here it is that time of year. The grasses are starting to think about growing. So they've gotten those cut back. They've got the roses cut back. And then we noticed the uh, distillium that they have on the two ends. Uh, these are uh, non-native, but non-invasive. But they're in the witch hazel family, in the, that fa same family that has Laura Petalum, a few other interesting ornamental plants that we use. And I just wanted to show off the flowers that are on these. They're not super significant, we wouldn't call them, but you can see that same kind of furry little uh, flower that we see on Laura Petalum and on witch hazels. Uh, all of these members, of the, a lot of the members of this family all have this, these little frilly flowers. Again, a, kind of insignificant on distillium. I think we'll see in the future, distillium was kind of a non, you know, an unknown uh, plant genus to horticulture 20 years ago. And I think we've seen a lot of breeding for full plants, really great foliage, upright varieties, ground cover varieties. I think we'll see breeding going forward in the future trying to get these flowers to express themselves a little more uh, because they are they are interesting and they are showy but again they're so close to the stem that they don't show off all that much but great ornamental plants the tree behind me is one of my one of my favorite trees i had a dawn redwood uh, at the old house this is one of the deciduous conifers we have you know four or five different deciduous conifers so uh which which is interesting so in the winter time it doesn't have any foliage on it but it does develop uh, these uh, male and female parts that hang down in little racemes off the tree, and then it forms the tiniest little cone. This giant, giant conifer has the tiniest little cone uh, on it, and it, it's always super interesting to me that it wouldn't have some big, giant uh, cone, uh, you know, forming the seeds. What's so beautiful about these trees once they get to this size is how much other life they have on them. They have these red, these red trunks with slightly exfoliating bark. They'll have mosses growing in them and just really super interesting uh, trees. This is not one for a small lot. I had an acre and or close to an acre at the old house and it wasn't, it wasn't enough space for it. It really needs these types of park spaces to really be able to get big and show off. And I will tell you the roots run everywhere. So unless you have a, if you had a big giant lot and you could put one of these way away from the house, way away from a septic tank um, and allow it to really take on what this one's been allowed to do. And again, you need a city park, you know, or a, or a very, very large lot. But if you do, there's nothing more beautiful and more, you know, uh, it has all the things that I love about trees. Uh, it, the fall color is kind of a rusty color and it's not for everybody probably, but it is, it is striking uh, when it's, you know, it has its fall color. As it's leafing out, it has kind of a limey, lime green foliage on it uh, as it's leafing out and it's incredibly soft to the touch. So really just a four season plant. I absolutely love Dawn Redwoods. Here's a very large apartment building in a very well-developed area. They have a, ver a tiny amount of space trying to get plants that make a big impact. Uh, and they've used some plants that will grow definitely more fastidious or upright. Uh, so there are some green spire euonymus down here that have reached probably six or eight feet as I'm standing up above them here. Really nice shiny green foliage on these. There's a podocarpus uh, over here. Again, podocarpus is always going to be a great plant. These in open space, by the time you get to Raleigh here, can be damaged in the wintertime. So it's not probably not a great screening plant if you was in an open space, but this giant apartment building and the parking lot where Steph is standing is blocking the wind. So it's keeping them in pretty good shape. Lots of Shindo viburnum and Shindo viburnum are great uh, evergreen plants for growing very vertical. It's not a native viburnum. We have lots of native viburnums, but these aren't um, invasive uh, in any way. And then there's a sweet bay magnolia uh, right after it. So they kind of rotated here, Sweet Bay Magnolia, uh, the uh, Green Spire Euonymus or Fastigit uh, Evergreen Euonymus, the Podocarpus, the Shindo Viburnum and done that over and over and over again. And it's a great mixed border screen like I talk about a lot of times, but they're able to 
they only have this much land. It's maybe 15 feet wide and whatever amount of length this is. And then they've got in the understory here, they've got some azaleas and some other evergreen shrubs some camellias a little further down. But they made the best of what they could out of this space. And it's created a pretty nice border, um, you know, along the edge of this par uh, giant apartment building. I think this will be an interesting little uh, discussion here. Uh, this is a leather leaf viburnum and it's, it's just a fantastic uh, viburnum. It, it has these leathery leaves. That's why it's leather leaf viburnum. Viburnum tend to bloom March, April, May, most all the species do. And a lot of people, you know, confuse them with hydrangeas at times because some of them are ball shaped or whatever. This one tends to have a little flat cluster of white flowers. Uh, maybe this one's in a hair too much shade. It's stretching just a bit. The other thing you'll notice on this one is the black that's on these leaves. Uh, this is actually sooty mold, which is uh, uh, some mold growing on a uh, poop <laughs> from uh, a problem on this crepe myrtle. This crepe myrtle actually has bark scale, uh, which is kind of a new, new thing here in Raleigh. It's been down on the Gulf Coast for a while, but it's managed to move up here. You can see the scale insects attach themselves to the tree and just like aphids, they secrete uh, a very sweet substance in their poop and it lands on everything down below it. And then you get the mold grows on the leaves on the plants uh, down below it. It eventually, you know, eventually kind of flake off, you know, flake off of the leaf. But by the time that happens, uh, this tree will be, you know, these scale insects will be active again. This crepe myrtle is obviously in so much stress. It's been butchered over the years because there's power lines above it, but it's been it's obviously under so much stress that it probably has aphids as well. So it's probably the combination of aphids and bark scale uh, causing the problem on the viburnum down below. But we'll, you know, if we do any more, you know, we're doing these neighborhood uh, tour videos. If you're interested in us continuing them, you know, let us know down below the video. Over the next few weeks, we'll see, we'll start to see the beginning of what I call viburnum season. That's one, you know, just one of my favorite times of the year because all the interesting native and non-native uh, viburnums uh, start going off uh, pretty soon, showing off their you know beautiful new foliage that they put out, beautiful flowers, of course. Uh, a lot of them get great fall color. Again, lots of native and non-native uh, varieties, but I thought it was just kind of interesting to show you know anything planted under a crepe myrtle that has either aphids or this now this bark scale. Unfortunately, you know this is can be the result of the plants down below them. Here's a great example of a Yoshino cryptomeria. Uh, that's, I guess at this point, about 20, 25 feet tall. They'll get as big as you want to let them get. I had one at the old house. It was probably touching 35 feet uh, when I left the house. It'll eventually shade the bottom of itself out a bit and thin out. But we put a video up on all things Japanese cedar a few weeks ago, if you want to go back and take a look uh, at that video. There are some prostrate plum yews uh, planted on this, little, uh, on this little slope. Pretty much any shade uh, plant uh, any shade garden tour that we do around the city of Raleigh, you're going to see these prostrate plum yews. They're just such easy plants. They're they're extremely drought tolerant. Uh, great texture. Uh, really does fantastic on a bank like this. We did a video at a at a house a tour video at a house a couple years ago, and these were used up kind of hold the bank in place. That house has since been sold, and we walked by there a little while ago. And there's major construction going on, erasing that garden but uh, still a great video and i'll link that i'm going to link that video down below so you guys can see you know a beautiful shade garden uh here in raleigh there's a uh, uh some wheeler's dwarf pittosporum uh here and then over to the right uh, of the camera uh, and what a great plant we have one of these in our back garden and of course our garden is one of everything so we just have one of them but i think planted in mass like this you can see how effective this Wheeler's Dwarf Pittosporum is it being a ground cover and a low growing shrub kind of all at the same time. And they've mixed it in with these rocks and it creates almost an interesting kind of Japanese garden uh, look to it. It is a um, Japanese plant, uh, but it, I, I just, I love the look of it. You'll see uh, this, these will bloom with a little interior fragrant flower a little later in the spring. One other sure sign of spring, uh, as, the flock, as the ground cover flocks are starting to bloom. So here, here's a white one. Again, I, lo I love white flowers. I just do. 
a lot of the things we've shown off in this video actually have white flowers, but white's so showy. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially when you get in a space like this, I'm standing in the sun right now, but most of the day, this garden is gonna be in kind of a mixed, mixed light with long shadows and these white flowers uh, stand out and it up at the top of the bank there they've got some acaris uh, just really super showy uh, it gets a little you know all the all the all the leaves on it from last year are a little bit uh, a little bit beaten up but it gets some new foliage pretty quick and it'll look fantastic again and then they mix those wheeler's dwarf pittosporum in i talk about this frequently when i'm doing consultations with folks is we don't, of course, don't have gardens necessarily that are, you know, an acre like this one is. But sometimes in design, if you'll take, you know, that like this Wheeler's Dwarf Pittosporum, if you were using it on one side of your foundation planting and you planted like five of them on that one side, if you'll carry one or three over to the other side at some other spot, it will look like you had a plan in place. And so you're transitioning to other plants, but you're including one of the ones from the other side in it. And it just kind of make again makes it look like you had a plan when you started. This is in that same garden, uh, another nice little planting here. This is a golden Hinoki cypress, and we don't get quite as much as the new growth starts on it. We'll get a little bit more of this gold color in it. The gold is out at the t kind of the tips on these Hinoki cypress, but you can see how big. You know, we have a dwarf Hinoki cypress at the house, and even it will get big. It just kind of grows slower than others. But the regular Hinoki cypress and the gold Hinoki cypress can become small trees. Uh, over time, they're Florida Sunshine Elysium, and what a standout! In a, in a, in again, it's a. I'm, I'm standing in the sun right now because of the time of the day, but for the most part, this garden's going to have long shadows across it uh, frequently, and this plant's going to be a standout in those conditions. Uh, there's a Camellia sasanqua. This one would have bloomed back in the fall, uh, and then there's an Acanthus uh, down at the bottom. And our acanthus has died completely to the ground. We got enough coal. Ours is exposed enough that it got enough cold on it that killed it back to the ground. It's already starting to put up some new growth. Theirs is a little more protected, so a little bit has died back, but the rest has, uh, has it still looks fresh. There's some uh, dwarf mondo grass uh, as a ground cover, and then one of the weeping red buds. My guess is is this is the purple foliage uh, uh, red bud, which is a uh, Ruby Falls. Ruby Falls tends to have a little more, let's call it character. <laughs> you know, I never see two of them look alike. And so that, I, that, I think that's what that is. My Golden Falls tends to weep downward pretty fast. And most of the Golden Falls red buds I see are pretty identical. Uh, but, but again, Ruby Falls tends to have a mind of its own, slightly different growth habits. I'm, I'm guessing that's what it is. So it'll have purple foliage when it comes out. Uh, get some flowers on it here in the next few weeks and then purple foliage. This is one of our great native viburnums. This is viburnum obovate. I've shown Ralston's hardy viburnum many times, which is the dwarf version. This is obviously the larger growing version and they're just always blooming. I mean, the things bloom. It is no exaggeration six months out of the year. They'll do this early spring blooming and then during the summer, you'll see repeat flowering on them. These have been boxed off. We were down at Flagler College, put up a video on the Learn to Garden video uh, series showing these basically as boxed hedges which is almost what's going on uh, with these. I love, you know, looking over the top as stuff comes up. These giant well tongue agave uh, back in the background of them. Are there, they're like beams of light uh, in this garden. Again, this garden has kind of got some dark spaces in it, but this is a sunnier spot up on that bank. And those agave are absolutely loving the well-drained soil up behind that retaining wall. Uh, there's some uh, variegated yucca blended in with them and then there's some ro more of that rosemary uh, this time of year is always in kind of full bloom and it's getting plenty of sun up there looks beautiful but blue flowers on the rosemary that kind of light blue color of those agave the variegation in the uh, yucca and then coming down here to these uh, evergreen viburnum this garden over at the Pullen Park Theater has a couple Italian cypress in it. You can see them from a long way away. They're always standouts in the garden because they have such a unique habit. Uh, just, it, you know, all, always interesting plants. We're very much on the north, kind of the northern area, probably where, where they can be grown, where they can be grown and, and grown well. Of course, we see lots of them out in the, uh, more in the southwest part of the United States. And they're always so uniquely, you know, soldiers standing out in a, in a field uh, that, are, that are always interesting. But these two have done really, really well over here. This plant 
Uh, to my right is the main one that I wanted to talk about here. This is a Ponceris. Uh, some people call these Osage oranges. The citrus industry grafts citrus trees onto this plant. It's got a very vigorous root system. So uh, this is the plant that's typically used uh, to graft onto. The seeds come up reliably. Uh, this is the straight uh, species, uh, trifoliata, I think. Uh, I'll correct that if it's not trifoliata down at the bottom. But you can see how angular all the branches are. Uh, they come off at a very particular angle off of each branch. Uh, every thorn has, you know, has a similar angle coming off the branch. The thorns are straight. Uh, there is a variety called Flying Dragon that I grew for years, and it is the contorted version of this, and it's the more common one you'll see out, out in the trade. Uh, I would imagine maybe this one was planted as Flying Dragon and then a sport, and you know, it reverted back. Uh, to the straight species at some point. There's a bird's nest up in here. This is the smartest bird in Raleigh because ain't nothing coming to bother you <laughs> in this plant with all these thorns. So that was a good, that was a good place, I think, to, uh, uh, to put your eggs if you're a bird uh, and you're selecting a spot. There's a couple oranges left on these uh, right here. They're extremely bitter, like, I mean, inedibly bitter and, and super, super sticky. We used to have to open them up and get the seeds out on the flying dragons. And we'd seed them out in the spring and maybe 10% would come up as just the straight species angular like this and we'd dispose of them and uh, keep the ones with the, you know, the really contorted habits. I used to sell these at the farmer's market. Nobody knew what they were, the contorted one. And I'd tell people to put them below the windows around their house because ain't nobody coming through a window with one of these parked in front of it. This has always been a fun plant to see out on our journeys uh, around the neighborhood. This is a loripetalum that's weeping over this wall, but it's, an, it's a regular loripetalum variety, like a larger growing one. They keep it about two feet tall, then they shear it along the front of this wall right here, where you would think like purple pixie would just grow like this. It would weep, it's a weeping one, and it would weep down over the wall. But this is a regular loripetalum, large growing loripetalum. Again, don't know what variety it is. You're gonna be limited on the number of flowers. It's about to flower, but having to shear it all the time, you're probably gonna lose uh, some of the flowering. I had no idea that a Laura Petalum would be willing over time to just bend down and weep down uh, to the ground like this. But just over time of pruning it like this and pruning it from the top, they've created basically a Laura Petalum wall in front of their retaining wall. It's just incredibly interesting. We're over here at the uh, Pullen Park Theater, which is right next to uh, North Carolina State University. There's several beautiful gardens uh, collected together uh, in, in this space. But here's a Fatsia, and we showed the Fatsia on one of our walk around videos blooming, uh, you know, a month ago or so. And then they form these interesting little seed heads uh, in these umbels like this that are absolutely, it still look very striking. It still looks like it's in flower, uh, even this late you know, in, in the winter here. So these would have been absolutely covered in pollinators on warm-ish, warm-ish days uh, back in late December through the month of January. And then they get this. And of course, the, the foliage looks kind of tropical. Great shade, evergreen plants here. They need to be slightly protected space where we are further south. You don't have to think about it as much, but we are on the kind of northern edge of where these will grow. Lots of large camellias in this space. Camellia japonicas that are currently blooming, camellia sasanquas that would have bloomed in the fall. This one is 20, 20 plus feet in height. Uh, moving over to this side of the path, there's a really interesting cast iron plant here with a very narrow foliage and spotted leaves. Uh, really looks fantastic. They'll get in here, I'm sure, in the next few weeks and clean out some of the old foliage out of this. It's that time of year you have cast iron plants. You can go in here and any of the tattered foliage, you can cut it down to the ground. If you find that you've just gone too many years without cleaning them up, you can just cut them to the ground if you want to before the new growth starts on them. You got to get on it sooner than later. It won't be long before they're putting on new growth. And then another plant that I'd like to point out here, this is Camellia sinensis. This is T. Camellia. Uh, it's, got a, uh, it's, got, it's got a vine uh, growing up. Uh, growing up through the middle of it, but that is Camellia sinensis. It has a small, smaller flower, but if you like drinking tea, uh, that's what the plant uh, looks like. Uh, tea farms, they only use the newest, the very, very newest growth. So if you went to a tea farm, you'd see these kind of hedged off as like almost boxwood style. And then every single time they get a little new growth on them, they take that new growth off. That's what's used 
uh, for tea. But it's also an interesting uh, ornamental plant as well. Beautiful foliage, great, you know, reddish stems underneath, underneath that, a very serrated uh, leaf edge to it. Again, much smaller flower. There's not, they're not ornamental like the Camellia Sasanquas and Japonicas and other hybrids uh, that we see. Uh, they're definitely, uh, you know, less ornamental flowering than that, but it's kind of cool, right, to have a tea plant in your garden. So there you go. There are some interesting things uh, that we see are around the city of Raleigh on a month, you know, on a on a month to month basis. Steph and I, you know, during COVID, this is you know during lock you know lockdown time. This is all we did. We explored the city. We know where lots of interesting plants are throughout the city. We would just le literally leave at seven in the morning and just go, you know, for hours and hours and hours out exploring. And uh, so if you're interested in us continuing, you know, this series of videos, just going out into the world and exploring, finding some interesting plants, uh, let us know down below. Thanks for watching.